Okay, so a very warm welcome to the first online screening of The Oil Machine. We'll have a debate right after the film, but before we show it to you, I'm delighted to be joined by a special guest, no doubt known to all of you, George Monbiot. Really great to have you here, George. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks very much for having me on, Terry. So, I mean, we, we've just had um, what looked like pretty unsuccessful talks um, on climate at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. Why is a film like The Oil Machine particularly important at this current moment? Hmm. So governments are not going to act on this great existential issue until they are pushed to do so by the people. We've now had 27 of these meetings and 26 and a half of them have failed. There was a half success in Paris at 2015, but all the rest have just been desperately, frantically avoiding the real issues. And there are only two things you need to do to prevent climate breakdown, which is leaving fossil fuels in the ground and stop to stop farming animals. Those are the only things you have to do Basically, everything is solved if you do that. There's just a few details to tidy up beyond that. But neither of those objectives have even been mentioned in a single declaration coming out from any of the COP meetings. If governments had intended to sort this out, there wouldn't have been COPs 2 to 27. They would have fixed it in COP 1, pretty well as they did with ozone depletion, where the major issues were sorted out and one meeting in Montreal and any subsequent meetings were really about details and implementation but we haven't got to that point after 27 of these meetings it's a catastrophic failure and usually when you um, keep doing the same thing and expect different results people call that a definition of madness but that is what our governments have been doing so, so what what really is the logjam here, George? Is it the um, you know what is stopping governments from acting? We don't expect corporations who've got legacy assets and debt tied up with this. But why won't governments act, and how do we make them act? The greatest threat, both to democracy and to life on Earth, is the power of money in politics and. The legacy industries have been building up enormous profits and reserves over the years, and they need spend just a very small amount of that to buy all the politicians and all the policies they need. And there's something that operates in politics, which I think is very important to understand. I, I call it the pollution paradox. And this is that the most antisocial companies, the ones which do the most damage, either damage to the living world or damage to society are those which have the greatest interest in spending money on politics because otherwise they would be regulated out of existence. Therefore, politics comes to be dominated by the most damaging industries. We end up with the worst possible people in charge at the worst possible time. And we have together to try to break this logjam. Um, this is why direct action and other forms of citizens' political action are so crucially important. We cannot afford to leave politics to the politicians. And it, you've been pretty critical about the media in its role in all this, the whole public messaging around fossil fuels, uh, essentially sort of accusing the media of being as complicit, as guilty, as the fossil fuel companies themselves. Why do you say that? It's the media that grants not only fossil fuel companies, but also all other damaging interests, their social license to operate. It's the media that normalizes the activities that are destroying life on Earth. It's the media that makes the arguments that defend legacy in industries and defend the power of money in politics. And so that's why I believe you know, if you were to ask me what's the most damaging industry, fossil fuels or the media, I'd say the media because it's the media which enables the fossil fuel industry to keep going alongside all the other threats to life on Earth. 
And if it is up to direct action, if it is up to us to take these steps, um, you know, it, it's concerning to see up to 30 often young people in jail in Britain at this moment for taking protest action. Is this a civil liberties issue that should be raised immediately? It's extraordinary what this government is getting away with. Um, uh, if you are a protester, you find yourself confronting laws which would not be out of place in a dictatorship, and they're getting worse. So, for instance, the Public Order Bill, which is now passing through Parliament, um, says, among many other draconian provisions, that if you have attended a protest in the past five years at which serious disruption has occurred, and serious disruption incidentally has been redefined by the Police Act to include noise, so in other words, if you've been to a protest where some noise happened at any time in the past five years, or have encouraged anyone else to attend such a protest, you can be fitted with an electronic tag, have surveillance equipment put in your home, be forced to report to the police um, as and when they choose, um, be forbidden from associating with certain other people or going to certain places. It, it's the sort of conditions that a dangerous criminal on parole might be subjected to. Um, th these are police state powers and they're being deployed against the people who are doing all they can to protect life on earth. Yes, indeed. I mean, there's someone who lives in a local village who's a, an outstanding member of the local community who's um, faced with um, imprisonment possibly next week. And, and um, the village is, is aghast at what's happening to her. But also are, your reference. Sorry. Well, I was going to say that these are extraordinarily brave people and they are reviled by politicians. They're reviled by the media, but they will be seen as the heroes of this age just as the civil rights campaigners and the suffragettes and the anti-apartheid campaigners and the independence campaigners are seen as heroes of previous ages. They too were reviled. Um, they, they were treated um, as the worst of the worst when they were alive. But only later, in looking back, do we see what freedoms they granted us. And if we are going to get through this century and those that follow, it will be in large part because of the brave actions of activists such as those now being sent to prison. OK, listen, thank you so much for, you, for those words, George. Very inspiring and interesting. Um, so we'll now proceed with the screening. And don't forget to join us afterwards for a debate with some of the key people from the film.